You're listening to the Jam Pro Show, all about movies. And today, my guest is Jack C. Newell, and we're talking about his brand new film, Monuments, which was absolutely. I love this movie. It was adorable. I loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. I have to tell you, I really, really did. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to discussing this movie with you. So welcome to the show. Well, I really appreciate that. I'm very happy to be here and happy to talk with you about it. Yeah. Great. Great. So our audience knows. Uh, tell them a little bit of a synopsis of what Monuments is all about. Okay. Fade in and the first credit. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> The movie is about a guy named Ted Daniels, whose wife, uh, and Ted is played by David Sullivan, and his wife played by Marguerite Moreau, um, sort of starts off and they are in the process of getting their marriage back on track uh, when she dies suddenly. And he gets it in his head that to honor her legacy, he needs to scatter her ashes at the Field Museum in Chicago. And they live in Boulder, uh, Colorado. And uh, so the film is this road trip uh, of him going cross country um, and getting into and out of all these different situations and running into all these crazy characters along the way um, uh, on his journey to try to do this thing where he scatters her ashes. And I will hold back on anything more uh, so people don't get, because that's part of the point. Obviously the movie is less about the destination and more about the journey. So a lot of it is ha what happens along the way. Well, it's definitely a road trip. <laughs> For sure, for sure. Well, I, you know, there's so much to this movie. Um, first of all, I love your lead characters, David Sullivan and Marguerite Moreau and Javier Munez, is that how you say it? They yeah. are so wonderful, all of them. Just yeah, the, the chemistry between all of them. And uh, it, it, it just is, it's just a wonderful movie. <laughs> it really is. It's a, it reminded me a lot um, of, the other some other filmmakers it was sort of like a Wes Anderson film in a way to me and a little bit Coen Brothers so if we can cross those two I don't know yeah. if you, you were going for that but that's what you know it came yeah I mean me. those are both obviously huge insp inf inspirations for me um in a lot of ways and so I know th those are two wonderful pulls and I think those guys are definitely definitely in there you know we're pulling a lot from films from like the 60s and 70s sort of early Spielberg um and going for like a sort of older style of filmmaking that's a little bit more character focused um, and spending our time with these characters and spending the opportunity like on this journey with them but doing it in like the sort of fun grandiose big picture action adventure sort of way um, and and so and so yeah I think you hit the nail on the head though with with the inspiration point uh, Ted and or David Sullivan, Margaret Moreau and Javier are amazing in the film and wonderful to work with and and honestly took each one of them, you know, and this is, I'm, this is the guy, I'm the person speaking right now who's the person who wrote it. And even right. like once I got to directing it and started working with the actors, I was like, wow, these are hard parts because David has to do, he has to do a lot of things believably. He has to be a convincing romantic lead. He has to be convincingly do drama. He has to convincingly do action, adventure, slapstick comedy, witty comedy. I mean, he has to do everything and he does that all beautifully. Um, Marguerite, I remember halfway through filming, she was just like, we were just doing the work with each other. And she's like, Jack, my character's dead this entire movie. Like, I have nothing to pull from. Like, how do you, how do you prepare for this character? You know, it's like, I hadn't thought about that, you know? Um, but she does it with such grounding. I mean, it's so, so great. And Javier's character is, that could have gone in so many different directions. And he's a big, larger than life. In, I mean, his name is Howell. So like when you write a character whose name is a verb, like how, what do you do with that? And he just, he, he did it you know, again, like I said, beautifully, he just did a wonderful job with it. He did. So much pathos. So, say it again. So much pathos. There's yeah. just, even though he's angry and fighting and masculine and overtly like alpha the entire time, there's a lot of sadness there too. 100%. And, and that could have been a role that was done over the top, you know, it could have, gone you know in a whole different direction more slapstick than you know than than it did and he did a wonderful job of you know exactly it's a character that's larger than life but he does it in a wonderful way and you're right uh, there is a there is that sadness underneath his character no question about it no yeah, question yeah. that comes through and and that's hard that's hard to do when you're playing a character that is larger than life to also portray 
that layer of, you know, that there's some hurt and sadness underneath all of it. And, right. uh, you know, he did a really good job. They all did. I, I, I love David Sullivan. I mean, I'm just in love with him right now. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. he's not a romantic leading man type yeah. of, you know, actor, but I'm just like, I was just, just thought he was absolutely adorable and, uh, and, really adorable. and just fell yeah. in love with him. So yeah. good casting. So talk about, let's talk, let's talk about that process. And Marguerite, oh yeah, I mean, you know, they, they played so well together in this film in all aspects, you know, portraying the marriage when it was, you know, breaking up and the problems they were having and then, you know, the coming together and um, just did it beautifully. They just had this magic chemistry, which yeah. you hope that you, you get. It's like, you know, lightning in a bottle, right? Um, you well, hope yeah, and you never know. Perfect. I mean, you want to you want to cast partly is that you want to cast the best actors for every role and even if you do that sometimes it just doesn't click you know and, and that's just the nature of of the of the art form and just the nature of how collaboration works sometimes for us we we knew very much so that they needed to really click and the, and i think part of what i need to give credit to to those three and the rest of the cast is that they really trusted me this is a really ambitious film creatively and ambitious from a production standpoint and to get everyone on board to be like, okay, here, here's this journey we're gonna go on. And they all said yes to it. And so I really owe them a lot. Um, and we, you know, we had them all come out a couple of days before cause we filmed in Chicago, which is where I'm based out of. And so uh, David and Marguerite came from LA and uh, Javier came from um, New York. And so we spent, you know, and we did rehearsals and choreography and costume fitting, all that sort of stuff you do during the prep period of time. Uh, but it was also very important to us just to build rapport and to hang out. And so um, we, and we did that. And by the end, I mean, we still, I talked to Marguerite yesterday, we we're just chatting about random stuff, sending voice memos back and forth. Um, so that's the sort of beautiful thing that comes out of a collaboration is you end up meeting some friends for life, but David and Marguerite, I think, especially because, you know, like early in the film, as I said in the in the intro, for those of you who haven't seen the film yet, like they are putting their marriage back together, which sort of means that like the couple of scenes that they have together, um, they're not it's not all never, everything's not great. And so it's a challenge from a storytelling standpoint to have the audience connect with these people when it's not all just like we're in love with each other. Everything's hunky dory. You're seeing two people who are sort of in a moment of crisis in their relationship and then you also then need to sort of like want to root for them, even though they're sort of in a weird breaking up thing. So it, it there's a lot, a lot going on there. And, um, and so we needed them to really be believably in love with each other, which I think they did. They did well. Oh, they definitely did. And, I, and how did you come up with the idea of all of these? Oh gosh. <laughs> My oh, process. God. Yeah, it's really iterative. I, I I really like to, it sort of started with a short story that my mother-in-law had written about a guy who loses his wife and scatters her ashes at the museum. And um, I really connected with it. And I started there and then sort of went, honestly, just sort of went from there and used it as a way to talk about, because I've dealt with um, loss and in, in, when I was younger, uh, my mom and my brother passed away when I was in high school and college and never really dealt with it you know it's not some and that's part of the point of the movie and that's one of the things is like you don't get past it like there's never a moment and movies a lot of times I think want to be like and then I moved on like I, I got over it and it's that's just not how it happens and I'm I'm where I'm at right now in my life and I'm in a good spot with it but that's not to say that in five years it can hit me again in a way that I was completely unexpected for you know and so part of the movie is about exploring that and talking about how my experience with grief and loss and all that is it's non-linear it doesn't necessarily make emotional sense sometimes it's just there's sublime moments and there's sad moments and there's beautiful moments and there's silly moments and there's absurd absurdity and that the, the idea of the film and using the structure for my mother-in-law's short story was that it allowed me to tell the story a fairly linear story that has a clear beginning middle and end but do it in a way where i could approach it and sort of talk about all of these things Beautifully said. Thank you, yeah. Jack. Really, you're right. It you never when you have grief, you never know. You know, it can be years later there'll be something, some reminder, and all of a sudden you'll just start crying, and you go, well, you know, why am I crying? You know, right. but it's that memory and um, it brings, and that's good. I think that's a good thing. I think yeah. when we step down those emotions and we don't, uh, you know, uh, allow grief. Uh, to go through that process of grieving, which a lot of people don't, right? They step it down and go, okay, I'm over that, let's move on. 
and then it comes back and bites them in the butt you know well times. absolutely and i think that's a lot of times i think why you see movies that are so simple because they're just like they put them in a box of their own and it's like, okay, just go here when you want to feel sad and just watch this movie and feel sad about it. And, and that's why this film is a bit more on the challenging side because it is doing all of these different things and allowing you to laugh. Cause when you see monuments, you will laugh and you will root, you'll get excited. And, and then you'll also cry, but you might not cry. You know, it's not going to, it's going to, your cries are going to happen at different times than like, you know, than maybe what you think. And so I think, it's a it's a unique film in that regard because it's I always say it's tonally promiscuous and like I think I enjoy playing in that space and I think anyone who watches it you could have five people watch it and each person's going to get something slightly different from it and that's I'm okay with that I don't think everyone needs to watch you know look at the Mona Lisa it's the most famous painting in the world and every single person who sees it sees something completely different you know I feel like cinema a lot of the time it gets pushed towards like this movie was good or bad it made you feel this or that and this thing and I think sometimes we get a little bit simplistic in how we even want to take in films and so this is trying to challenge that a little bit. I usually, you know, I, I, I do movie reviews uh, or I was doing movie reviews and uh, although when I studied film um, learned then never read a review before you go see a movie I like to go in cold I like to not know sometimes I have no idea like with the movies I watch for the show for the, for, sure. for this for the show uh I don't like to read the press notes going in I just sort of like okay I'm just gonna watch this movie as it's on its own and then afterwards I'll read the press notes obviously to prepare for the uh right. the interview but I I always that's been something I've done for years and years and years and years just yeah. sometimes not know anything you know and just and i'll save the reviews sometimes to read afterwards to see well did that reviewer see the same thing i saw and sometimes it's totally opposite you know and and, and, I, and you know movies are uh, personal it, it's personal for all of us because again we're filtering through our own experiences and how we're feeling that particular day have you ever watched a movie you know maybe five years ago and then you just said oh I think I'll watch that movie again and your reaction to it five years later is completely different because you have five years of experience instead of yeah through. so it's yeah it's very uh, subjective very subjective well yeah. yeah and I think from from my point of view as a filmmaker you know and, and I don't write reviews obviously but um certainly read read them or mm -hmm. um have them you know at directed towards you and I think you know the, what you as soon as you make something and it's done and like a film it's gone it's not yours anymore like my my interest in filmmaking is the process of making the film it's not having it not it's not necessarily having made a film you know I, I like the process of like the collaboration of telling a story about like hey let's all do this thing together let's use it as an opportunity to talk about these things like we don't normally get to talk about in 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 general conversation about grief or if it's in another film i'm making just about about that um Sometimes you do films in a little bit more of a craft-based sort of exercise if it's a work for hire sort of thing. And that's interesting in its own right as well. But once you make it and you're like, it's done, you don't, it's not yours anymore. And then it becomes the interesting process of people watching it and taking it in and then pushing it, putting back onto you. Like, here's what I'm seeing, which is all, you're gonna have all the different things that come out of that. People love it, people hate it. And this is just writ large, you know, not necessarily about this one, but um, that's the, that's something that I always find to be interesting. And I think that, yeah, I think what you said about going in, not knowing anything is definitely, I'm incredibly good at like, my wife, whenever we watch a movie, she'll, something will happen and she'll be like, oh, he's the killer or whatever. Like if you're watching one of those movies, cause she's mm -hmm. like, well, you know, 15 minutes in the movie and he just did this thing that's super shady. Like, of course he's the killer. And I'm like, how do you know? I'm like so good at being dumb when I watch movies. <laughs> and then at the end I'll be like, I can't believe he was the killer. She's like, it was so obvious. I was like, wasn't obvious to me, you know? She's like, why else? Why else do they cast Jude Law in this like walk on part here? You know, it's like, it's not going to be like, he's probably coming back. He's probably the killer. But in the moment, it's fun to just, that's what movies are about. And that's sort of the reason why this is, to, why Monuments took the form it, it did of like an action movie is that like, that's, I think not all movies need to be action movies, but it's what you can do in, in cinema is like, it's movies are escape, they're fantasy, they're dreams, they're, they're dreamscapes. Um, you can do these things. And I think that's part of the reason why you go to the movies. It's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons why is to go on, a, on an adventure. And sometimes that adventure is manifest like it is in Monuments. Sometimes it's obviously, you know, you can have an adventure without leaving a room either, but that's the interest. Yeah. And, and I, I always say, 
a movie it should move you in some way. So whether it was, if it's supposed to be a comedy, you should laugh, you know, if it's a tearjerker, you cry, you know, that it, it has some kind of emotional component. Um, I hate it when you go to a movie and you go, oh, well, that was a, you walk out and you've got the movie, you know, as soon as you leave the theater. I mean, yeah. I like it when you have, have a movie that stays with you and you think about it and, and you know, you go, oh, I'd like to see that again because I'm sure there's other parts of that that I missed, you know, yeah. that I'd like to go back and look at. And this film does have, it, it really, Monuments has a big movie feel to it. Yeah. And um, as I always say, and I just said it in my last interview, and I'll say it again, movies should be seen in the movie theaters. And this is one that should be seen in the movie theaters. It's just got a beautiful uh, scenery throughout the film. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just got that big film feel to yeah. it. It's not, it doesn't have a small feel to it. You know, mm -hmm. some, a lot of times with independent films, you know, they feel like smaller independent films. This is not, this looks like a, a, a it, you know, feels like a much bigger film. So let's talk about that because you, you know, it is a road trip and you did have to go on the road. So what was that like filming it on the road in all these different wonderful places? I mean, it was, it was great. You know, we filmed most of it in Chicago in the suburbs of Chicago. And then we moved the whole production to Boulder, Colorado and filmed there. And then we went away and edited for like six or seven months and then did some pickups where we drove again across country. And so, yeah, we definitely got to see from from Boulder to Chicago and back again. I got to see it. Uh, I'm intimate, familiar, intimately familiar with the uh, Route 80 or whatever it is that goes the other way. Um, well, it's amazing. I mean, that you're right, because we wanted to make it feel like a big movie. And I think there's a, the three ways in which we're doing it in this film is like through location selection. So like just picking the right locations for this that are doing a lot of a lot of heavy lifting for us, whether it's like the Field Museum or that abandoned drive-in movie theater, which is just like this incredible relic from like a different age, it feels like, especially now, um, or the mountains of Boulder, like just trying to find these amazing locations that just speak for themselves. And then Stephanie's uh, cinematography of it, of just capturing that in all of its grandeur. Uh, and, and the very good work that Matt Highland did as production design to try to take these natural the occurring elements and like zhuzh them, you know, the, when we filmed the the scene at the well, like we built that well actually, which is crazy because someone like had to like build a well and we had to dig a hole and all that. And, um, but part of what was so magical there, and this is one of those happy accidents that happens when filming is that we were in that forest during like the one week of the leaves changing. And so we didn't like change those leaves in post using color correction. Like those were just that insane color of yellow. Yeah. And, and that was, and that sort of sums up the whole experience to answer your question of just all, finding all these incredible locations and then finding out how to photograph them in, in the best way possible. Um, and so it was just great fun. And like, you know, I've done a lot of travel and open tables. There's a sequence that happens in Paris, which is a film I did uh, five years ago. You know, I got a documentary that I'm working on in Haiti. And so I, I really like travel period. And I like the idea of travel with, with films. Um, so that's that. And I said there were three ways of doing grandeur. One was locations, one was cinematography, and the third one was the music. And I think because we're pulling, yeah, because we pull so heavily from films from, so like for people listening, it's like, okay, you're an independent filmmaker. You're trying to figure out how to make a big, a big movie, but you don't have, you know, Scarlett Johansson. You don't have explosions. You don't have some of these things. You're not telling a superhero movie. Like what do you do? And if you look back to, films from the from honestly from the beginning of cinema through like you know the 80s the, a lot of the way in which they're doing is through just like a really big juicy score and so when I was working with my composer uh, Nick his uh, moniker is Takanobu is what he goes by if people want to find him um, I was like this is what I want to go for like I think if we don't nail the music like it's gonna it's gonna feel small and um, and so we worked really hard to get this really big like monumental quote unquote <laughs> Sad trombone, sorry, I had to say it. You had uh, to. <laughs> monumental sort of sound in the film. And, and I love what he did. I mean, it's such a cool, it's a good, catchy sort of theme song. Um, and he's able to do the like the real tender moments really, really well too, which is hard. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you about the music. So you just jumped right into it because the music is such an integral part of this film, definitely. And I love, you know, I'm, well, I've said this over and over in the show too, but I'm a credit watcher. I've been watching credits since I was a kid. I believe a movie's not over until the credits are all done whether okay. you know i know any of those people or not i feel like i owe it to them to watch you know but well, you 
totally agree. I love watching the credits. Me too. And and you learn a lot because you learn, okay, where did they film this? You thought it was filmed, you know, in uh, Wyoming. And actually it was filmed in, you know, uh, I don't know, Arizona. <laughs> so, you, yeah. And that's always interesting too, to find out where they film it. But I love it when, um, when, when directors put like little fun pieces in their credits. Not everybody does, but you did. Yeah. And I thought, I, and I really enjoyed that. So I did want to tell you that some, I did watch the credits and Very I much. did appreciate all those little things that you put in. in the yeah. I love, we always watch the credits um, for even before like the Marvel movies started putting them up and like, and, and putting the thing at the end, like always just cause it's the movie's not over. And I remember during a pandemic, during pandemic, one of the things that my wife and I did to get through the pandemic was we just watched a ton of uh, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers musicals. Yes. Love them. Amazing. <laughs> Me too. Um, but now it's like whenever we watch an uh, opening uh, um, uh, credits to some of these movies, we're like, did did Irene do the gowns? Because it was always gowns by Irene. And it's just amazing. Like the days of a credit where it's like gowns by a one named person. Like, I don't I would love to make a film where I can have a credit in there's like gowns by Jeff or something like that or something like <laughs> gowns by who did the gowns? Um, but yeah, so I was actually that ends credits thing. So the opening credits. I was always designed, was always going to be that way that was just the sort of idea of playing with um, really big, again, like setting up these vistas, the whole music thing, like that was pretty, pretty much storyboarded and like knew exactly what this was going to be. The big font, the sort of big, everything's monumental. It's just big, yes. big, big. Yeah. And then for the end of the film, I was just, honestly, I was, so the film, when we were doing the post on the film, the editor, David, was living in L.A. at the time, but he moved into my house for like six months and edited that. And then after a certain period of time, he's like, my my girlfriend, you know, wants to see me. Can I go back to L.A.? And I was like, I suppose. So he flew back to L.A. and we had to finish the film with me going out there. And so I was on a flight to um, L.A. and uh, to work on the film near the end of the process. And someone like two rows up and one over was watching Crazy Rich Asians. And they finished the film. And if you know the credits of that film or if you've seen that film, it has a very like colorful, fun, exciting end credit sequence. Now, so I'm two rows and a half back, not watching a movie, watching this person watching Crazy Rich Asians. So I don't know the music that's happening. I didn't watch the movie that, at that time. Um, but I was just looking at it aesthetically. It's like, that's really fun. And like, and that's something like a big studio movie would do like, and they did because it's mm -hmm. in crazy occasions. And I was like, why can't we do that? Like why, who's to say like an independent sort of smaller film that has this sort of energy, why can't we do that? And so I sort of pitched it around to the rest of the team and everyone was like, that sounds great. And we had had all this um, art created actually for the swag for the crew. We had uh, the the art uh, or the art director's wife is a graphic designer, and she made these like cool little iconography of all the different things in the film. And uh, we gave it away in little tote bags. And I was like, what if we took that and sort of found a way to integrate it in, and um, and sort of went from there. And it is it's a lot of fun. I think it's a nice because the movie ends on a. You know, the movies ultimately, if you have to categorize it as something, it is a comedy. Like it ends on an upswing. It's not a tragedy, no. even though it deals with sad things. And so the film ends on on an upswing. Like he's gone through some stuff and now he's he's going to be OK. You feel at the end of the movie that he's going to be OK. I hope I'm not ruining this movie. Um, no. And I, I like the idea of like you could just cut to black and it's like, you know, or you can sort of reinforce this idea. It's like, hey, you know, it's OK. Like we're we're all gonna die we're all we all gotta live you know we're gonna get through it exactly i have about a minute but okay I really since you brought up fred astaire and ginger rogers let's talk about the dance sequence because that was amazing and <laughs> i really want to talk about that and as i said i have about a minute and then i also want to tell people where they can see this movie so yeah so the dance sequence yeah, the, the dance sequence was uh, always designed in there. It was a song that my my dad was significantly older when he had me. And so he actually grew up listening to Spike Jones, And so I just had, I've known that song since I was like a kid. I was going to ask you how you chose that, why you chose yeah. that, that, that particular song. So now it, you've answered that. It's so. everything. It's the whole movie in a distillation because it's a known song that is it's sort of sappy and, and sort of you know saccharine and then it has this like, insane twist on it and that's this movie because it's like we're dealing with serious stuff we're having serious conversations but we can do it in a way where it sort of goes go crazy bonkers for a second and so that in a lot of ways that's why that's that scene is the heart of the whole 
of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and if people want to watch the film, it's now available. Well, I guess I don't know when you're releasing it, but on August 3rd, um, it's available. So you can pre-order it now on iTunes or Amazon. And then starting on August 3rd, you can watch it whenever you'd like. Wonderful. Oh, I'm so glad. And people really go find monuments. It's, it's just, it's a really uh, wonderful film. You, it's it's different. It's quirky. It's unusual. Uh, that dance scene I just loved. Um, and there's so much about it. I just loved every minute of it. And so thank you, Jack, for being on the show. I look forward to having you back on the show. I can't wait to be back. And I hope people do watch it. And I do think this is going to be a film that is going to stick with them. You know, when it, they're not going to finish the movie and be like, oh, that's OK. I think they're going to definitely have uh, some lingering thoughts. So. I agree. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. But thank well, you. you. So yeah. If you have missed any of the Jam Price shows all about movies, you can get find all of the archive shows on the jampriceshow.com. You can also uh, find us on iHeart Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iTunes, Anywhere that you get your podcast, you can find us. We are there. Also, go to my YouTube channel, The Jam Price Show, and uh, like us and subscribe to us, too, there. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Jam Price Show. Thank you all for listening.